This is Democracy Now!, The Quarantine Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Nermeen Sheikh. President Donald Trump acknowledged Wednesday he publicly downplayed the threat of the coronavirus, even as he received briefings in early February about the severity of the looming pandemic. Trump was responding to a reporter who asked if he misled the public in order to reduce panic. Well, I think uh, if you said in order to reduce panic, perhaps that's so. The fact is, I'm a cheerleader for this country. I love our country. And I don't want people to be frightened. I don't want to create panic. Mission came hours after Washington Post journalist Bob Woodward published bombshell experts from his forthcoming book about Trump called Rage, along with taped conversations with the president. In a February 7th phone call, Trump told Woodward about what he learned about the coronavirus from Chinese President Xi Jinping. It goes through air, Bob. That's always tougher than the touch. You know, the touch, you don't have to touch things, right? But the air, you just breathe the air. And that's how it's uh, passed. And so that's a very tricky one. That's a very delicate one. Uh, it's also more deadly than your, you know, your even your strenuous flus. This is more deadly. This is five per, you know, this is 5% versus 1% and less than 1%, you know, so... This is deadly stuff. Now, again, that was President Trump on February 7th. But the White House would not declare a national emergency on COVID-19 until March 13th. The revelations come as the U.S. death toll from COVID-19 reached 190,000 on Wednesday. This comes as Trump's push to release a vaccine before the November election, called Operation Warp Speed, could be slowed by a lack of participation in vaccine trials by African American, Indigenous, and Latinx people, many of whom mistrust the healthcare system, even as the coronavirus disproportionately impacts these same communities. A National Institute's health report attributed part of this mistrust to, quote, the historical legacy of mistreatment at the hands of the medical profession. The most notorious abuse of African Americans at the hands of the medical establishment was the Tuskegee syphilis experiment. In 1932, the U.S. Public Health Service recruited 400 African American men with syphilis studying the disease's progression when purposefully left untreated. The subjects were given useless placebos and tracked over decades as their symptoms worsened, even though penicillin was identified as a reliable treatment in 1945. Syphilis can disfigure, cause dementia, blindness, extreme chronic pain and death. Repeated concerns with the unethical study were ignored until a whistleblower's account of the experiment to the press in 1972 shut it down. Well, on Tuesday, the NIH attempted to overcome the legacy helped la and helped launch a series of TV commercials on the BET network, the Oprah Winfrey Network, Telemundo and Univision, like this ad, which features a series of black people. We know that someone, somewhere, is full of hope and strength and wants to take action and will take a step forward to hug her grandkids. Walking the walk and rolling up their sleeves to go back to normal sooner. Volunteer to find the COVID-19 vaccine. We're joined now by Harriet Washington, medical ethicist, author of Medical Apartheid, the dark history of medical experimentation on black Americans from colonial times to the present. Her latest book, A Terrible Thing to Waste, Environmental Racism and Its Assault on the American Mind. Welcome back to Democracy Now!, Harriet Washington. We're going to talk on um, global issues in a moment. But for people who are not familiar, for example, with the Tuskegee experiment, and what that experiment means, which you lay out so well in your book, Medical Apartheid, uh, how this could possibly happen. I wanted to go to a 1993 document documentary about the Tuskegee experiments called Deadly Deception, uh, which addresses how black men were lured into the Tuskegee experiment with assurances they were actually receiving medical care. Many told spinal taps were a form of treatment. This clip includes interviews with Tuskegee subject Herman Shaw and medical historian Vanessa Gamble. This letter sent to each man before his spinal tap claimed it was a very special free treatment. Some time ago, you were given a thorough examination. And since that time, we hope you have gotten a great deal of treatment for bad blood. You will now be given your last chance to get a second examination. This, this examination, examination is, is a very special one, after and after finished, it is finished, you will be, you will given, be given a special, a special treatment, treatment if it is believed, if it is you, believed are you are in a condition to stand it. 
Remember, this is your last chance for a special free treatment. The men were told that the spinal taps were a treatment. That shows you some of the deception and deceit involved in the study. And these are physicians saying this so that it has a certain power and authority of physicians saying this. On each subject, they performed physicals and blood tests. And to maintain the appearance of treatment, the doctors gave the men placebos, vitamins, aspirins, and tonics, all useless against syphilis. We got three different types of medicine. We got a little round pill, and sometimes they give us a, a capsule. And then they would use a little vial of liquid medicine. Everybody got the same thing. These were men who weren't going to question the system, who weren't going to question the government doctors, who weren't going to be out there picketing and writing and protesting about it. These were men in Macon County, Alabama. Who was going to speak for them? That clip from a 1993 documentary about the Tuskegee experiment called Deadly Deception. This experiment, Harriet Washington, went on for 40 years? Yes, it did. It's the longest instance of um, unethical medical experimentation in Western history. However, it's one study. My book, Medical Apartheid, documents centuries of studies many, if not most of which, were far worse than Tuskegee. Can you go through just some of them with us, a kind of um, short journey with us to the—I mean, it's hard to talk about this— of the um, experimentation on African Americans in this country? Of course. You know, it's 500 pages and four centuries, so I can't possibly summarize it. But they range from things like— um, pouring boiling water on the backs of slaves to treat them for typhoid, to removing slaves' arms and legs simply to show medical students how the procedures of amputation were done, to uh, locking women in um, literally a cage, a small laboratory on the um, property of Dr. James Marion Sims, and then subjecting them to reproductive surgeries that were experimental over the course of five years at least. and. Um, then also removing the jawbone of a slave despite his protests, testing vaccine on slaves, testing other novel procedures, and appropriating the bodies of slaves in order to test modalities, in order to use them for various experiments, and also to use their bodies after death for anatomical dissection as med medical training material, post-mortem racism. These things were so prevalent that most uh, northern medical schools had contracts with southern medical schools to get the bodies of dead black people because they didn't want to use dead whites in this manner. It was considered disrespectful. Um, the history is extremely extensive. It goes on for a very, very long time. And frankly, it has not ended. When it comes to vaccine, I actually find more troubling, far more troubling than Tuskegee, which is not a good parallel for this um, problem, um, more recent um, problems with vaccines. Uh, vaccine experiments that have been very, um, have been unethical and exploitative, and other procedures, especially in the developing world, that have been exploitative, that have caught the attention of African Americans and others. So even the recent history of vaccine abuse has been very troubling and caused a lot of reticence. Harriet Washington, could you talk about how widespread the knowledge is of the older medical experiments that you were speaking of and what role you think that history, um, as opposed to uh, the treatment of uh, Latinx and African Americans in the medical world today, to what extent is knowledge of that medical history uh, kind of a disincentive for people to enroll in the vaccine trials now? Uh, as opposed to the continuing uh, uh, discrimination uh, against Latinx and black communities uh, now. I would, I would not put those things in opposition to each other. They both contribute. But it's important to realize that the written history of medicine, the canon, has been carefully curated to um, elide the experience of African Americans. You simply would not find uh, this history detailed in other history of medicine books. Until Medical Apartheid was published, it was ignored. It was certainly documented in the past in old journals, in um, 
medical doctor's own, um, you know, own research reports, but no one had collected it. So you find that in academia, there is very little knowledge of that. However, amid African-American communities, there was a great extensive knowledge of it because there had been a rich oral tradition passed on. Many people had those in their families who had been subjected to, ex to experimental abuse, and this knowledge was prevalent and passed on. So we had the unusual situation where African Americans were quite conversant with the history. They may not have known, they probably could not have known, the details that I got from reading medical journals, because they were not allowed access to the medical journals, but they knew these things were occurring. Um, but in terms of history of medicine canon, they were routinely ignored. And there was a lot of reluctance until Medical Apartheid was published. And scholars could see how um, carefully I had documented the things I had described. Only then was there an admission that these things had actually happened within academia. Dr. Fauci, the um, uh, infectious disease specialist, um, says that uh, if you look at the trials that are pl taking place in the United States today, Moderna has 16 percent uh, Latinx participation, um, Pfizer has 11 percent Latinx participation, um, Moderna has only 10 percent black participation, and Pfizer only 8 percent. Fauci recommends 37 percent. Latinx participation and 27 percent black participation. When we come back, we're going to go global um, with you, Harriet Washington. Again, uh, Harriet Washington is a medical ethicist and author of Medical Apartheid, The Dark History of Medical Experimentation on Black Americans from Colonial Times to the Present. She mentioned a Pfizer test in Nigeria, and we'll talk about that, look at South Africa, India and beyond. Stay with us.